Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Komla Dumour. Well, I haven't had the opportunity to offend anyone yet, so surely I deserve a better round of applause than that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Morocco. My name is Komla Dumont. I work with BBC World News. I'm sure some of you may be familiar with some of the programs that I do. Does anyone know about a program called Focus on Africa? Can I have a show of hands? Oh, I'm in good company. I'm in very good company. And those of you who do not, well, there's an opportunity to watch it uh, sometime next week when I get back to London. I'm absolutely delighted to be here at the Atlantic Dialogues. It's an excellent opportunity for us to engage about the major issues of the day. Let's start like this. What is the biggest news story leading the headlines right now? I'll give you a hint. It involves a certain president on one side of the Atlantic and a chancellor on the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> What's the big story? Okay, that's good. All right, let's pretend we're in class for a minute. We're talking about that, right? Okay, for me as a journalist, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting and compelling and powerful story that we want to focus on. But how does it feed into our conversation here? How does it connect to this continent that I cover quite a bit? I'll take you back roughly a month. Let me just step over here for a minute. A little over a month ago, I was around here. I was in Kenya, standing in front of the Westgate Mall. 72 hours reporting on a real tragedy. So at a time when people are talking about issues of national security and what kind of access the public should have to information that is being watched or being detected. The interesting thing is, initially you would say, well, what does this have to do with Westgate? But then a month later, you're seeing connections between the alleged per perpetrators and people in Norway, people in Great Britain, and the Midwest of the United States. This is the perfect forum to have a conversation like that. Why? Well, sitting right here is a rear admiral from NATO. I'm, uh, I'm right. Admiral Humans, very nice to see you. If you want to talk about those issues, here's your guy. What about trade? Trade is incredibly important. I mean, we're talking about a connection between the United States, Europe, and Africa. Let's talk about trade for a moment. A few months ago, I was asked by the BBC to cover the second tour of the President of the United States to Africa, Barack Obama, the President of African descent, if you like, returning to the continent after six years. Well, what is interesting about his trip is that he started in Senegal, up here, he went down to South Africa, and then he went to Tanzania, and I was covering these legs. But what I found very interesting, and again, I'm drawing on all these connections that we're seeing here is that almost a month before he got there, another president had made almost the same trip. He went to South Africa, then he went to Tanzania, and it was his first trip abroad. Can anyone tell me the name of that president? Yeah, his name is Xi Jinping. Yeah. And covering this trip, and President Obama arrives in Tanzania and says, we are announcing a $7 billion energy fund for Africa. Power Africa. What I found extraordinary is that he was saying that at a time when Xi Jinping, a month earlier, had announced a $16 billion investment in Tanzania to build ports. Interesting, isn't it? How these relationships are evolving, how these relationships are changing. We have a senior representative from the Brazilian government in the audience. I met him just a few moments ago. Uh, Mr. Da Silva, ah, here he is. You want to have a conversation with him as well. So this is a forum where we're going to talk about the issues that connect all of us, not just above the Atlantic, but below that equator. I mean, if you think about it, outside of Nigeria, the biggest population of people of African descent is in Brazil. Brazil just did, what, $12 billion worth of trade with the continent recently. Juma Rousseff in Nigeria. And let me say one quick thing about Nigeria before I wrap up my remarks. I was looking at data from the UN population analysts, and they're saying by 2050, 
there'll be more Nigerians than Americans. Did someone look, do people look nervous or something? <laughs> I think Nigerians are wonderful people. But if you think about it, the third most populous country on the planet by 2050 will be Nigeria. So if you aren't learning Hindi or Mandarin, you better start working on your Yoruba right now. <laughs> These are just some of the conversations we're going to be having over the next two days. We have an excellent panel that's gathered for the very first session and subsequent panels that'll be engaging, that'll be powerful. But I think the most important thing is that all of you bring your expertise and your backgrounds to bear on the conversations. Be engaging, be challenging. Take on the status quo as far as perceptions are concerned. And with regards to that act, I'm going to leave you with my final thought before I step off. Usually when they talk about Africa and talk about news in Africa, yes, you tend to get some of the Westgate news. You tend to get developments in Mali. But for me, as someone who reports on business and news stories around the world, the big story that I think many people may have missed when it pertains to Africa and connects to our entire conversation is this. In 2009, I went to a small country, two million population, called Botswana. And they are the biggest producers of what? Yes, gem diamonds in the world. If you're fortunate enough to have a spouse who gives you one, or you can afford one yourself, there is always a strong possibility that that diamond came originally from Botswana. However, Botswana in 2009 was like many other African countries exporting raw diamonds. In 2009, I went there to a, little bi a big building. It was almost empty, and they called it the Diamond Hub. Lots of buildings, a few people around, and I asked the director of the place, what is this place for? And he said, well, you know, we've been exporting raw diamonds for years. In a few years, we want a bigger chunk of the diamond business. It's a $50 billion industry. We want a little chunk of that. So they were teaching people from Botswana how to cut and polish diamonds. And here's the big story that I think some people may have missed. This is about changing perceptions. Earlier this year, De Beers announced that it was moving some of its major operations to Habaroni. Nicky Oppenheimer, quoting him, said, the center of gravity of the diamond business is moving to Botswana. What does this mean for other African countries? What does this mean for trade between countries of the South? What does this mean for American influence and American leadership on the continent? Ladies and gentlemen, I certainly hope you have wonderful conversations. And at the end of it, we go away thinking, I'll be back definitely next year. Thank you very much. Enjoy your very first session. Thank you, Komla, for that very fine presentation. It was a great scene center for this weekend. Ministers, excellencies, Mr. Mayor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the Atlantic Dialogues 2013, and welcome to Rabat. We're very excited to be back in Morocco, and this year we are deeply honored that the Atlantic Dialogues 2013 is held under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI of Morocco. We're also very gratified about our continued partnership with the OCP Foundation and the OCP Policy Center in organizing this conference. This initiative would not be possible without the excellent cooperation between our organizations, a cooperation that goes beyond this conference and extends into a number of programmatic areas. We're also so pleased to have so many Americans joining us here in Rabat, including U.S. Senator Christopher Murphy especially given everything that's been going on in Washington, the fact that you're here is a, a real sign of how much you care about these issues. After last year's successful launch of the Atlantic Dialogues, we're delighted that many of you are joining us again this year, but also that many of you are with us for the first time. This weekend, you are part of a very diverse and high-level group of policymakers, business leaders, and opinion shapers 
from Africa, the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe, and North America. We are very proud to welcome participants from 57 different countries of the wider Atlantic Basin. The overarching theme for this weekend is the connections and networks that are among our countries and the people in this basin. Over the coming days, we will discuss in a variety of formats the joint challenges and opportunities facing our basin with regard to security, trade, resources, energy, infrastructure, and demographics. Now, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to two important components of the conference. The first is our Emerging Leaders Program. We're very happy to welcome 50 emerging leaders from 27 countries of the Atlantic region. These emerging leaders started their program yesterday and are now joining the Atlantic Dialogues. Building on our own long history of leadership development activities, we are very happy to have started a new chapter in this history together with the OCP Foundation and the OCP Policy Center. Uh, I hope you all get a chance to meet some of these really outstanding young people. If you could just hold up your hands real quickly so they can get a sense of who some of you are. And we've actually asked a few of them to close this conference with their own reflections on what a younger generation thinks about all of the great knowledge that it will be imparted over the next few days. Second, I'd like to introduce you to ADC Connect. This is this great piece of software that some of you got when you came in. We're gonna have a longer explanation of how it works and in just a few minutes after the next introduction. But it is our way of trying to create a different dimension to this meeting. One of the reasons we like working with the good people at the OCP Foundation and Policy Center is that they have kind of a techie bent. And after last year, they were convinced that there was something more that we could do using iPads that would make this conference come alive. And I think you'll see that there's some pretty cool things that are possible with this technology. I've been asked to pass on to those of you in our audience who use and follow Twitter that the hashtag for this event is hashtag Atlantic Dialogues, all one word. And with that, let me thank you for joining us in Rabat. We're confident that with your participation in the Atlantic Dialogues 2013, it will be a challenging and successful event. Now it is my honor to introduce Ms. Mabarka Bouaida, the Minister Delegate for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Morocco to welcome you all. Minister. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and sharing this important dialogue on the region and topic that competes all, as all, uh, whether by geographic location or other. I would like to thank the German Marshall Fund and the OCP Foundation and Policy Center for giving me the opportunity to take part in their action to foster dialogue for a better Atlantic space. Ladies and gentlemen, given the geopolitical realignment that have occurred thus far in the region, the new political dispensations affect the regional balance of power. These dispensations also point to the key role of economic development in, the, in regional stability and progress. The role of Europe and the United States remains critical, but new dynamics are at play. The emergence of the Middle East and North Africa as a region of change the rise of new cross-border and trans-regional uh, trans challenges in the Atlantic space, the growing prominence of geoeconomics all influence the direction of the new dynamic. Transatlantic relationships are stronger and more defined than ever before. Partnerships between countries are the tenet to any international policy. Together, all nations form a bedrock for a powerful strategic understanding. The Atlantic Basin, like its counterpart in the Pacific and Indian regions, ocean regions, comprises a highly complex and very diverse group of countries. A wider Atlantic space 
featuring a balanced relationship between North Atlantic countries, as represented by NATO and the EU, and the emerging economies in Atlantic Africa and Latin America will reinforce the existing transatlantic bonds as a way to help with common challenges. The Atlantic space is a region connected by growing linkages and common challenges such as the economic crisis, food security, climate change, energy secure and security in the high areas and the, in the high seas are becoming more urgent and we, would, we, would, we should seek to our counterparts across the ocean in an effort to resolve problems collectively. As, an interdep as an interdependent relations grow through this basin, new vulner vulnerabilities, but also new opportunities emerge. The vision of an Atlantic system for the 21st century must be a positive vision of shared growth, opportunity, and stability. Morocco's geopolitical orientation is a result of development on the regional scene in Northern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, evolving relations with leading partners in Europe and the United States, and not least the emergence of new partners and new opportunities in the Atlantic space, North and South. Despite the impressive economic growth and political cooperation among emerging Atlantic basin, basin countries, a tour d'horizon around the Atlantic reveals the emergence of a more cohesive system in the wider Atlantic with implications for Morocco. More than ever before, the region finds itself in a hostile and uncertain environment with both opportunities and threats. The stability of states is threatened by the volatility and security due to the presence of terrorist and separatist group, as well as from trafficking activities in the region. Today, the assessment of the situation in the Sahel region is that there is an urgent need for a new regional, inclusive, and global approach and security paradigm that focus on the root of these negative challenges and develops an affirmative vision for the future. Morocco's vision is clear. Security cannot be achieved without a stronger focus on social and economic development. This is our shared responsibility. Due to the transnational nature of the trade and opportunities, sub-regional cooperation alone is not enough to tackle these various issues. A global strategy that incorporates all African regional subgrouping, Yuma, uh, the North African or Arab Maghreb Union, ECOWAS, SENSAD, will be the ultimate platform from which an effective, rapid, and permanent solution will stem from. As an actor in the Atlantic space, Morocco continually research in the, its Atlantic identity and transatlantic connections. The concept of new Atlanticism was highlighted at the Tricontinental Atl Atlantic Initiative Conference held at Sherat in Morocco in May 2009. The gathering was tricontinental in design and participation and is emblematic of Morocco's growing attention to identify geography and variable geometries in external policy. This cross-Atlantic perspective has unsuspected synergies and encompasses opportunities for shared development, particularly suited to the current conjecture and global issues such as social cohesion, sustainable development, food security, climate change, and biodiversity, migration, and security issues. His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, in his speech to the Moroccan Diplomatic Corpus, last August 2013, provides a renewed impulse to pursue developing lasting ties with Atlantic bordering countries in Africa, given the 2009 Sherat Conference. The potential for Morocco to serve as an Atlantic hub is already at hand. The Tangier Medport is strategically well-placed to serve as a wider Atlantic shipping system. Morocco is also fast becoming a leading hub air travel and transport to, to and from Africa. Continued realms for, of in, infrastructure may well be the leading vehicle for Morocco to strengthen its role in, Af in West Africa, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the Maghreb. Morocco is also playing a growing role in the development of African agriculture, which is key not, not only for Africa's prosperity, but for global food security. Morocco will continue to develop his cooperation program toward Africa 
as contribution to the emergence of a common area of peace and shared property. I'm convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that the high expertise and experience of the founding partners will ensure the success of the next few days of your workshops for, of this dialogue. Good luck and thank you.